welcome to the keynote podcast from Kingdom Faith. Today's message is by Pastor Colin Urquhart. It's what comes from within us that matters. Now let's really rejoice in the Lord out of what is within us. Because that will pave the way for the way the Lord wants to encourage us through his word this morning. So come on, let's rejoice in him. This is the day the Lord has made. Let us rejoice and be glad in it. Hallelujah. Thank you, thank you, thank you, Jesus. Praise your holy name. Oh, you are so wonderful. You are so good. You are so mighty. Praise you, praise you, praise you, Jesus. Pura la basada baria leto bakala sitri sandaria leto bakala sato bakala sutri santo bakala sandama. Wonderful, wonderful, wonderful Lord. Yes, 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 yes. Mighty, mighty, mighty Jesus. Hallelujah. Pura la basada baria leto bakala sinama. O paparia leto bakala sitri sandama. O rata baria leto bakala sitri sandama. Thank you, thank you, thank you, Jesus. Praise you, Lord. Amen. Okay, let's, let's go and be seated. You know, joy, joy is the barometer of our faith. And when we begin to worship and to praise the Lord, we need to begin from a position of faith, not work up to a position of faith. Amen. When we come in here in the morning, we come in full of faith, ready to give Jesus our best. Goodness me, I'll go and have a day off if it's going to be like this. Amen. Amen. Right. Hallelujah. Let's turn to John chapter 15. Now, you remember that uh, in this passage, Jesus is referring to himself as the true vine. And the disciples are branches in the vine. The thing about a branch, Jesus makes clear, is that it cannot be fruitful unless it remains in the vine. So we are only fruitful if we remain in Christ. We're going to have to see what that means this morning. But of course it means that the branch can only be fruitful if it's also in right relationship to the other branches. If you've ever seen a vine, there's a a single stem, but from that there's a multiplicity of branches. And a branch is attached to another branch, is attached to another branch, attached to another branch. It's a wonderful picture of the fact that we can only be fruitful in the way God intends because we're in Christ, but we're also in right relationship to the other branches that are around us. Amen? That means that we love the Lord and we love one another as he has loved us. So, we'll read from uh, verse 4. Remain in me. I'm deliberately using the NIV this morning rather than the truth because I want to explain some things to you. Remain in me and I will remain in you. Now, this word that's translated remain is in the Greek in what is called the continuous present tense. It's to, to translate it uh, briefly in English is difficult. It, it's this continuous action. Go on continuously living in me. Remain in me. Stay in me. Keep on in me. It's, it's that sense of not just being in Christ, but remaining. There's a sort of emotion to it. Remain in me. Keep living in me. Now, we can only be in Christ 
because that's where God has put us. I explained in the first week of term to you students about the fact that we are in Christ Jesus. And Paul says in uh, Ephesians chapter 1 that you also were included in Christ when you heard the word of, word of truth, the gospel of our salvation, having believed you were marked in him with the precious seal, the promised Holy Spirit, who is the guarantee of our inheritance that is to come. So that scripture shows that when you first became a believer and received the Holy Spirit, that was the evidence that now you were living in Christ. Now what Jesus is saying to the disciples here is remain in him, stay in him, continue to live in him. And we'll see why he says this. Of course, if people just automatically remain living in him, there would be no sense in Jesus saying this. So obviously we're put into Christ, but there's things we have to do to remain in Christ, to live in Christ. Are you there? No branch can bear fruit by itself. It must remain in the vine. So this is something we must do. It's not an option. It's not something we might prefer to do. It's something we've got to do. Neither can you bear fruit unless you remain in me, unless you <coughs> continue to live in me. <coughs> Excuse me. I am the vine. You are the branches. If, now that word, if, speaks of condition. It's a condition. If you remain in me, certain things are going to result. First is that he remains in us. If you remain in me and I in him, or the man, if a man remains in me and I in him, he will bear much fruit. So <clears throat> how do we become fruitful? simply by remaining in Christ. If we continue to live in him, we will be fruitful. That's what Jesus is saying. Uh, neither can you bear fruit, or no, or where are we? Uh, neither can you bear fruit unless you remain in me. I am the vine, you are, a bran you are the branches. If a man remains in me and I in him, he will bear much fruit, Apart from me, you can do nothing. Now, the next verse shows that it is possible not to remain in him. If anyone does not remain in me, he is like a branch that is thrown away and withers. Such branches are picked up, thrown into the fire and burned. Now, if it's an option of either remaining in him and being fruitful or not remaining in him and being piled up and burned, I know which one I'm going for. <laughs> and what does it mean to say that the, those branches that don't remain in him are picked up, thrown into the fire and burned? What does that mean? You don't want to find out. Just take it as a warning. Okay, verse 7. If, there's that word again, it's condition. If you remain in me, and my words remain in you, ask whatever you wish, and it will be given you. Now, that's one of the great promises that Jesus makes concerning prayer. If you remain in me, and my words remain in you, ask whatever you wish, whatever you want. That's really what it means. Jesus means exactly that, and it will be given you. Now, you might sit there and think this morning, well, I've asked for a whole lot of things that I want, and they haven't been given to me. You might even say, well, I'm living in Christ, I know that, I'm continuing to live in him, and I believe his word, his words are in me, you know, his, his living word is in me, uh, so why isn't it that everything that I've said has been given me? 
Well, that's not what Jesus means. That's not what he's actually saying. You see, <clears throat> you've probably heard that in Greek, there are two words that are translated by our English word, word. One is logos. Now, logos is the unchanging, eternal word of God. Jesus said, heaven and earth will pass away, my words will not pass away. And we know in the opening chapter of John's Gospel, you new students, we were looking at that last week, the, in, in the Greek, the Gospel begins, enarche en ho logos, in the beginning was the Word, Jesus, the Word, the unchanging, perfect Word of God. The one who is the same yesterday, today, and forever. The Logos. And we know that the body of teaching that he's given us is that body of really uh, the Logoi, the words of God that will never ever change. They are eternally truth. They are the words of truth. The other word that is translated word is Rema. And Rema means the spoken word, the particular word that the Spirit gives us in the situation in which we're placed. Now, you understand a logos can become a Rema that the Holy Spirit takes one of the words of Scripture and speaks it to us so that it becomes God's word for us at that moment. Or we know that the Holy Spirit can speak to us. It will always be consistent with the word. It will always be in tune with the word. But he can speak to us, give us some word of encouragement, prophecy or whatever, correction even. And that is a rhema. Now, John, in his gospel, nearly all the time is using the word logos because he, he, as you all know, he is wanting to reveal who Jesus is and the whole gospel begins with this, he is the word, and okay, and ho logos, he is the word of God. But here in this verse, he's not using the word logos, He's using the word rhema. That is unusual for John. And it must therefore be because he's making a particular point. So if we look at verse 7 again, if you remain, if you continue to live in me, and the spoken words that I give you by my Spirit remain in you, then you can ask whatever you wish. Now, this is very important, you see, when we pray to understand this, because we are told also in Scripture to pray at all times in the Spirit. And that doesn't mean you just speak in tongues. Uh, Paul also says we do not know how to pray as we ought, but the Holy Spirit enables our prayer. So if we pray in the Spirit, we're not just speaking in tongues, we're letting the Holy Spirit lead our prayer. Now, faith comes from hearing the Lord. So if we're praying with faith, we're listening. And what Jesus is really saying is if you continue to live in me and the words that I speak to you continue to live in you, so even when you pray, you believe what it is that I'm saying to you, and you're praying in line with what I'm saying to you, then you can ask for whatever you wish. Why? Because you're listening to what he's saying. And you're lis if you're listening to what he's saying, you will not pray for something that is 
in opposition to what he's saying. In other words, faith always leaves the initiative with God. So what you are doing when you pray with faith is you're responding to the initiative of God. You're praying in the way that the Spirit leads you. Now when people understand this, understand what what Jesus is saying here, uh, it's, it's, it's easy to see, right, I need to be listening, I need to be praying according to the revelation that God is giving me by his Spirit. It's not, when Jesus has asked whatever you wish, it's not me simply having a wish list and saying, God, do these things. It's not for us to tell God what to do, it's for God to tell us what he intends to do. And that's why it's important for us to listen to what he is saying. Faith comes from hearing. And if you hear the revelation of what the Spirit of God is wanting to do uh, through prayer, then you can be quite sure that what he has said is what will take place. Because the Holy Spirit is the Spirit of truth, he's not the Spirit of deception. So the Holy Spirit will always guide us into the truth. He, always, he will always make it clear what it is that God is wanting us to pray because this is his will. The Holy Spirit, you see, is like the voice of God within you to reveal the will of God to you. You will never get God to do something he doesn't intend to do. It doesn't matter how much you rail and shout at him and try to shake the heavens. He will never do what he does not want to do. He will never do what what is in opposition to his intended will and purpose. So it's for us to line up with his will and purpose. And you see, if you don't... If you don't understand the distinction between these two words, Logos and Rhema, you can completely misunderstand this and say, well, so long as the word of God is living in me, I'm reading the scriptures every day and I'm believing the word, then everything I pray should happen. But you see, that's not what Jesus is saying. He's saying when you pray, you listen and you pray according to the revelation that the Spirit is giving you, the words that God is speaking to you that will encourage faith, that will show you God's intended purpose and will therefore enable you to pray fruitfully. Are we all getting this? All still breathing? Praise God. Okay, then he says, This is to my Father's glory, that you bear much fruit, showing yourselves to be my disciples. So if we pray like this, we're going to bear much fruit. Our prayer is going to bear much fruit. Our lives will bear much fruit. And Jesus said, by their fruit you will know them. So how can you tell a disciple of Jesus? Not simply by someone who claims to be a disciple of Jesus, but you see it in the fruit that is produced in his life. When you see the fruit, you say, that's a disciple of Jesus. So it's very practical. Jesus didn't say, by their claims, you will know them. By what they say about themselves, you will know them. He didn't say, by what they think, you will know them, but by the fruit they bear. And he said, if the tree is good, the fruit will be good. If the tree is bad, the fruit will be bad. So all this hinges around these two ifs. If you live in me and my words live in you. Now, I'm going to use a simple illustration this morning just to show you what this really means in practice. Take my sweater to represent Christ Jesus. If I'm living in him, I am in Christ. 
So Jesus says, I am to remain in him. Paul has said, I was placed in Christ when I first believed. Now Jesus says, continue to live in me. And if I continue to live in him, I will continue to live in his love. Because he is love. So let's read on for a minute. As the Father has loved me, this is verse 9, as the Father has loved me, so have I loved you. Now remain in my love. So here's another command. This is a command. It's not a suggestion. It's not good advice for your life. It's a command. A command from the Lord God Almighty. Remain in my love. So we've got two commands now. Remain in me, remain in my love. In other words, stay like this. Now, you've got to use your imagination even more because if you look at me, I am now Jesus. (coughs) And my sweater represents the Father. Because when Jesus was fulfilling his ministry on earth, he said, do you not know that I am in the Father and the Father is in me? If you have seen me, you've seen the Father. You see, Jesus lived perfectly like this. So perfectly that he said the words he spoke were the words the Father gave him to speak. The things he did with the Father, what he saw the Father doing. I haven't come to do my own will, but the will of him who sent me, the will of the Father. So he was submitted, yoked, if you like, continuously to his Father throughout his uh, life here on earth. So now he says, as the Father has loved me, so have I loved you. Now remain in in my love. If you obey my commands, you will remain in my love, just as I have obeyed my Father's commands and remain in his love. So Jesus is saying he was able to fulfill the will of his Father Because he remained in his love. He lived all the time like this. And he could only live like this because he obeyed the Father's commands. Now he's saying to the disciples, in exactly the same way, you will live in me like this if you obey my commands. And John, who of course is writing this and heard Jesus say these words, in his first epistle, he makes it very clear that uh, God enables his word to be fulfilled in our lives by his Holy Spirit. So God has put the Spirit within us to enable us to live like this. And John says his commands are not a burden. That if we love him, we will want to live like this. Now, what commands has he given us? Well, let's just think of one or two. Jesus says, do not judge. That's a command. So what happens if we're living in Christ and we judge people or we judge someone, this, we're not outside of Christ, but we're not living fully as one who is in Christ. 
we're not obeying his command. We think, oh, well, it's all right for me to judge this person because of what he's done or what she's said or whatever. But no, we've gone directly against what Jesus says. And he says, if you do not forgive your brother, then your Father in heaven will not forgive you. So here you are trying to walk with Jesus like this in unforgiveness. So if you're in unforgiveness, you cannot be in that right relationship with God abiding in his love like this. Are you all breathing? So, of course, what we do is if we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. So as soon as we realize, boy, I've, I've got into a negative mindset here, I'm judging, I'm unforgiving, Lord, forgive me. That's why, again, John says, if we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. So that forgiveness restores us and enables us then to continue our walk in Christ, to continue in his love. You see, if we've done that, we're not walking in love. Because Jesus says, whatever we do to the least of these, you do to me. So if you judge your brother, you're judging Jesus. Now, who knows, it's not a clever thing to judge Jesus. And if you're judging Jesus, whether you intend to or not, Jesus says that in reality is what you're doing, that raises you above Jesus in your thinking. Right? So it's important, isn't it, for us to maintain the right relationship. So John says... Uh, in his first epistle, echoing the words of Jesus, that if you do not love your brother who you do see, you cannot love God who you do not see. That if anyone says that he loves God but does not love his brother, he is a liar. He deceives himself and the truth is not in him. In other words, you see, what, what uh, the scriptures are teaching us is we can only live in, in the love of Jesus, obeying his command to continue in his love, to live in love for him, if we're also continuing in love for the others around us. This is not some sort of theoretical thing. Well, I love my brothers and sisters in Christ, or I love people generally. We actually specifically have to express his love to those that we're in contact with all around us. That is going to involve sometimes having to forgive them. Because what you have to learn is all the others around you are not as perfect as you are. <laughs> and there's going to be many times in which you will have to forgive them. And it's amazing, you see, if there is a seed of unforgiveness in you, you might, on the surface, make it appear that you've forgiven someone, but as soon as something happens that triggers off that negative reaction, whoops, out it comes again. And then you realize that thing has not really been dealt with. There's still that residual, that, that deep sense of whatever it is, unforgiveness, animosity, Jealousy, anger, frustration with other people. So God has got you living in close relationship with one another here so that you can really learn what it is to love. So to love, of course, is to seek the highest good of those around you <clears throat> not to live for yourself, but for them, as Jesus makes clear in a moment. Are, you, are we all right here? Are we all? Yeah. Okay. So he says in verse 11, I have told you this 
so that my joy may be in you and that your joy may be complete. Now it says in the opening chapter of Hebrews that it was the anointing of the oil of joy that was upon Jesus that raised him above his companions. In other words, the thing that marked Jesus off from everybody else when he walked on earth was not only his love, but he was more joyful than anyone else. Why was he more joyful? Because he lived continuously like this. In his father. He never did that. Never ever once. If he'd ever done that, there would have been no salvation for us. So it didn't matter what people did to him, he still remained positive. You think he was arrested, all his disciples left him. There's no sense that Jesus said or did anything negative. In fact, he was concerned about them. When they came to arrest him, He said to to the soldiers who came, the temple guards, he said, take me, but not them. He was concerned about them even then. They all fled and left him. No word of recrimination from Jesus, no word of criticism, no word of judgment. Peter denied him three times. Jesus turned and looked at Peter. I don't think he looked at him with anger. I think he looked at him with probably sorrow, compassion. Because Jesus had warned him he'd do that. Never ever did he criticize or judge or condemn Peter for what he's done. He obviously forgave him. He was charged falsely accused falsely. Jesus didn't say anything. He didn't feel sorry for himself. He didn't didn't try to to, uh, hit back at those who accused him. They whipped him, lashed him. And I mean, it would have been quite a lashing. No recrimination. No word of criticism. He's led before Pilate. Then he's mocked by the soldiers. He stands there, takes it all. He doesn't hit back. He doesn't judge them. He doesn't condemn them. Doesn't even condemn Pilate for condemning him. They take him to the cross. They bang the nails in him. And what's he doing? He's praying for them. Father, forgive them. Eh? Forgive them. He's in the Father. Father, forgive them. They don't know what they're doing. See, never, ever, ever was there a negative attitude, a negative word, despite all that was happening to him. Now, whatever happens to you is nothing by comparison. So what Jesus is saying, very well then, no matter what happens to you, you walk like this in Christ. You don't judge, you don't condemn, you don't criticize, you don't get into a negative attitude towards anybody. You see, you might fail, and God forgive you. Others might see that you failed and want to criticize you. Well, let them, because you've been forgiven, so you're like this. Those that are criticizing and judging you are like that. So you're in a better place, even though you committed the sin, because when God forgives you, your sin no longer exists. The scripture says it's obliterated. It's as if it never happened. Whereas the one who judges you for what you did is like this. That shows us, doesn't it, how important it is for us to maintain the right attitude towards those around us because otherwise we can't have the right attitude before God. 
When we're like this, things go wrong. And sometimes we don't realize that the things that are going wrong are going wrong because we're like this. We don't see the provision of God. We don't see the response to God. We don't see perhaps the healing of God or whatever it is that is needed in our lives because actually we're walking like this. Now, we're not separated from Christ. We're not, we haven't thrown Christ off. But neither are we in the place with him where he intends us to be, which is why things do not work out. Thank you very much. That's okay. There's forgiveness. I've got no negative response to you. I won't belt you if it happens again. Hallelujah. Are we, are we getting all this? So, verse 12, my command is this. What is the command that is essentially going to keep us living in his love and living continuously in Christ? Well, he says, my command is this. This is the command that if you obey, this is going to keep you living in me and living in my love. My command is this, love each other as I have loved you. How has he loved you? He's never criticized you, never condemned you, never been negative towards you. Every word he's ever spoken to you has always been encouragement. It's a word that has inspired faith. It's a word maybe of correction, but that's always for your good, the scripture says. Word of forgiveness, word of healing, word that lifts you up. You have never, ever, 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 ever heard a word from God that criticizes you and puts you down. Even when he wants to discipline us, he he doesn't condemn us, he just speaks a word of correction. Amen? Are we all at one? Okay. So my command is this, Love each other as I have loved you. Greater love has no man than this, that he lays down his life for his friends. So if you love as he has loved you, then the way he loved you was laying his life down for you. So you will love others by laying down your life for them. So that means you're living in love for others seeking their highest good rather than seeking your own good. Huh? Your own good will actually be found in seeking the good of others. in laying down your life for others. You see, this is what Jesus did. Jesus could only seek the good in his life by obeying his Father's will. But that was going to require great cost for him in all that he suffered and ultimately in laying down his life for us. But while he did that, he was seeking the highest good of all those for whom he died. But actually, he was also in the position to receive the highest good for himself. Because God raised him from the dead and seated him in glory at his right hand, where he now rules and reigns for all eternity. If he had sinned, if he had reacted negatively to anything that had happened to him, there would have been no salvation, and Jesus could not have returned to heaven to the Father. He would have joined us on earth as a sinner. And we can only have the hope and the expectation of glory in heaven because we can receive the forgiveness that Jesus made possible through laying down his life for us. But as we are to love others in the same way that he loves us, therefore we can only live like this 
by living for others. So we're all called to be servants. We're all given, therefore, a ministry of service to others. Now, the nature of that service may be different for different people, but the principles are essentially the same. That you love them, you seek their highest good, you don't judge, you don't condemn, you bless, not curse, you forgive, you don't take offense. Are we there? Because however you treat them, you treat him. So what Jesus is saying is you can only live like this if you love others in the same way that Jesus loves you. See, at my age, I could, like many others, theoretically, retire and not trip all over the place preaching the word. But the thing is, you can't retire from loving others. And actually, if you love others, you don't want to retire. So retirement isn't even on the agenda. I will never retire, I'll just expire (laughs) at some point. (laughs) But that will be for my greater glory. But you see, you're not here for yourself. What God is doing with you whether you're on the team or whether you're a student, is he's training you to live for others. He's training you to love. And he's put his love by the Holy Spirit into your heart to enable that. So if you continue to live in me like this, because of the way you're loving people, and my words and what I'm speaking to you, especially about my commands to love, are living in you. You can ask for whatever you wish, whatever you wish, and it will be given you. But there's a condition, you see, if. So if you pray and something, you know, doesn't work out, It's no use complaining to God, saying, Lord, you didn't do it. He said, well, did you obey what I said? Have you been abiding in me, living in me, living in my love? You see, what your brother or sister does to you that causes offense or some negative negative thing they do... may not cause the problem that you're praying about, but it can prevent you from receiving the answer to the problem if your attitude isn't right towards those who have offended you. Why? Because if your attitude isn't right, you're like this. But Jesus says you, you are going to receive whatever you ask in prayer if you're living like that. Are we getting this? Oh, hallelujah, hallelujah. So, <clears throat> greater love has no one than this, that he lays down his life for his friends. Jesus laid down his life for you. You lay down your life for others. Oh, what's that going to cost me? You won't worry if you love them. That's why John says his commands are not burdensome. They're not a burden. Not if you love. They're only a burden if you don't love. If you don't love, you think the command is something being imposed upon you. And we don't like this word obedience because you know you have to obey your parents, obey school teachers, you have to obey your boss at work, you have to obey. That's a different kind of obedience. Obedience. 
But when we love the Lord, and we therefore love his people, we're not obeying out of necessity. We're obeying out of choice. We're choosing to obey because we love. Uh Uh-huh. Are you there? So then Jesus says, you are my friends if you do what I command you. In other words, you live like this and you're my friends. You live like that and you're not living as my friend. And friendship has to be mutual, you see. If I wanted to be your friend, that would only work if you also wanted to be my friend. If I wanted to be your friend and you didn't want to be friends with me, then we couldn't be friends. It has to work both ways. Uh huh. So, you know, many people say, oh, Jesus is my greatest friend. Well, that's only true if you're living as his friend. He can't be your friend if you're not living as his friend. Hello? So you only live as his friend, Jesus says, if you command what he says. In other words, those who continue to live in Christ, those who continue to live in his love, they're living as his friends. And all of us may do a whoopsie like this, but boom, we can very quickly get forgiven and get restored. It's when we have a wrong attitude and we... I'm right. They're wrong. We're not walking as his friend. We're not abiding in Christ in the way that he says. We're not abiding in his love. So when it comes to prayer, Lord, why aren't you answering? I'm just waiting. Because there's an if. If you continue in me and my words continue in you, does that mean that God never answers prayers when we're like this? No, because he's merciful. But the really significant things don't happen when you're like this. Now, of course, it's very easy to get like that because if we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. You know, there's a couple of scriptures that say the testing of our faith proves it's genuine. How does our faith get tested? By the circumstances in which we're placed. Right, now let's see if we place you in this circumstance whether you are going to react positively or negatively. Hello? Now, it's great, you see, if the love is abiding in you, you're going to react positively. Sometimes you might get it wrong, but then the Holy Spirit is going to say, hey, 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 come on. (laughs) Of course, if we're really stubborn in a situation, we can get like this. And people can even backslide. But praise God, there is a way back, even for the backslider. But it's only through repentance and renewed faith. So, you are my friends if you do what I command. I no longer call you servants because a servant doesn't know his master's business. Instead, I have called you friends For everything I learned from my father, I have made known to you. Interesting, you see. I learned all this from my father. Do you understand that Jesus was a baby, and he did grow up. And when he was growing up, he didn't know everything. The scripture says that in his childhood, he grew in wisdom and stature. He learned very quickly. I mean, as a 12-year-old, he was correcting the theologians in the temple, which wasn't bad going, but (laughs) even you could probably correct the theologians in the temple by now, but you're more than 12. 
So <clears throat> we're going to walk as his friends, living in Christ and he in us. And we're going to be like Jesus. Everything he teaches us, we want to put into practice. Because you see, God doesn't just give you knowledge. He gives you understanding. Knowledge and understanding are different. See, <coughs> knowledge is just knowing something. Understanding it is understanding how that knowledge needs to be applied to your life. And what it says in Proverbs is get understanding. Even if it costs you everything you have, get <coughs> understanding. Not just get knowledge. Because actually, the scripture says knowledge puffs up. Makes people proud, just having a lot of knowledge. But if you get understanding, then you see how the knowledge that God imparts to you is to be expressed in your life. Somebody thought, amen, but as nobody else has said it all morning, you didn't say it either. Verse 16, you did not choose me, but I chose you. Chose you for what? For this. And appointed you that you may go and bear fruit and that your fruit should remain so that whatever you ask the Father in my name, he will give it to you. See, there's the promise again of answered prayer. Why? Why? Because he's chosen you to live like this. And if you walk like that, you're at one with him. Doesn't mean you won't have problems. You won't have the things happening. There'll be the testing of your faith. But you will overcome in every situation. That was worth an hallelujah. Hallelujah. So this is a very important passage. This is my, I think, my favorite passage of Scripture, without any doubt, John 15, because this, it was this passage of Scripture that was at the heart of the revival that we experienced in the 1970s, which had a profound effect upon, well, this nation and beyond in many ways because it gave birth to a whole lot of other things. So we praise God. It was all the work of God, you understand, not what we did, but what God did through us. But it was, I, I can remember, there was a period of 10 months right at the beginning of, of that revival when we couldn't get away from this chapter and what were the, the sort of complementary scriptures in 1 John. 10 months, every week, God was talking to us about loving one another, loving one another, what it really meant. You know one of the things John says that uh, if your brother is in need and you have this world's goods and you do not meet the need of your brother, how can the love of God be in you? And that's why God really taught us how to give to one another and meet needs in one another. And even in that church congregation, many were living as a community, sharing everything in common, simply working out the implications of this scripture. So, hallelujah. Listen, the Lord is happy with this message, so I'm happy with this message. <laughs> So you better get happy with this message. Because the two of us are agreed. Amen? And when you walk in agreement with the Lord, that's it. You haven't got anything else to worry about. 
And as I was telling some of you the other day, you're responsible for bringing whatever God gives you to bring, but you're not responsible for the way people respond to it. So I can bring you the word of the Lord, but you are responsible for what you do with it. So long as I brought you the word that he wants me, me to bring you. Hallelujah. One of the reasons why we had a, a really good weekend in Scarborough was this was the essence of one, just one of the messages that I was bringing. And I, I use this illustration because it's a good visual thing, isn't it, for people to really understand, well, what, what does it mean to continue in that love? So, this is the kind of message that you can't sort of stand up and say, I've responded. Because the only response to this is to live it out. Not just to say you agree with it, but to live it out. So, this is what God is going to be doing amongst us. But let's be clear, it's the work of his spirit within us. Because God has already poured his love into our hearts by the Holy Spirit. But we are going to pray so that every one of us has the opportunity to make sure that we're not like this. And you know we had a, another revival uh, in Kingdom Faith, not, not just in my church in Newton, but in Kingdom Faith. And I think that was the time when we, we lived like this more, more perfectly than I've, I've ever known before or since, to be honest. And uh, when, we, when we came together to pray... If there was anybody that was like this, even in the slightest possible way, God would not let, allow us to pray. He wouldn't allow any of us to pray in the prayer meeting. It was as if God was saying, there's something not right, put it right. And I would say, there's sin in the room. And somebody would confess, you know, I had a bad thought about boom, 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 boom. And they'd have to say, would you please forgive me? The person forgives me. We're all back like this and we can go. And let me tell you, God was answering prayer. We were seeing revival wherever we went. And this is it, you know. I mean, that made me realize that we get away with an awful lot with God. But if we're living like this, We're missing his best. That his best is only to be found by continuing to live in his love. By continuing to live in him. And should anything go wrong, get it dealt with quickly. Because let me tell you, if you don't deal with it quickly, it gets worse and worse and worse and worse. And it doesn't matter how much you try to justify yourself, you can never justify yourself before God. And it isn't until you humble yourself before him that you get back like this. Amen. Now, just before we pray, I'm going to quote one verse again. Because at this moment, you need it. <laughs> These things I have spoken to you, that my joy may be in you, <laughs> and that your joy may be full. In other words, that you'll be overflowing with joy. That means God is saying this to you for your future happiness now and forevermore. Amen? Amen? So let's all stand. Praise God. Hallelujah.
Thank you, Jesus. I'm going to take the sweater off, not because I'm no longer in Christ, (laughs) but because it's hot around my neck. Come on, let's just lift our hands. Come out of our seats here. Come out of your comfort zone to meet with the Lord. Just begin to praise him first of all. That God has put you into Christ. That's the work of his grace, isn't it? Love of God, hallelujah. He's placed you in Christ. He's placed you in his love. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. Praise you, praise you, praise you, Lord. Bless your holy name. Pura la la basatori a letter bagara sitri sandari a letter bagara sutri santo. Hallelujah. Oh, wonderful Lord, wonderful Savior. Bless your holy name. Praise your holy name. Thank you, thank you, thank you, Lord. Pura la basatori sarari a letter bagara sutri santoma. Hallelujah. Now thank the Lord that He's only done that out of His love for you because He seeks your highest good. Hallelujah. He wants your joy to be full because he seeks your highest good. So he says right now, the way for you to live in the highest good is to obey my command. And my command is this, love each other. If you don't love those you do see, you cannot love the the one who you cannot see. So thank him that he's poured his love into your heart by the Holy Spirit. So you can love others. You can love the others around you. You can lay down your life for them. Live for them rather than yourself. Live to give rather than to get. To bless rather than be blessed. You see, when you bless others, you are yourselves blessed because you will reap what you sow. So when you give, then God gives back. Good measure, pressed down, shaken together, running over. But you give first. You bless first. You love first. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. So thank the Lord. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, thank you, Jesus. Thank you, thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. Okay, so if there's any negative thought, attitude, reaction to anybody else, get it right with God right now. If after the meeting you need to go to someone and ask them to forgive you, do that. But get it right with God. Because he wants you in the place where you're living in him, living in his love, so your joy is full, and so that whatever you ask in his name, he will give it to you. You see, this is his spoken word. He's taken his logos and made it a rhema to you this morning. Hallelujah. So now it's for you to respond. Respond to this rhema. Speak, speak to the Lord. Move your lips. Form the words. Don't just think. Prayer isn't thinking. Prayer is speaking. Just make sure you've got the sweater on both shoulders.
Hallelujah. Thank you, Lord. Praise you, Jesus. Bless your holy name. Praise your holy name. Thank the Lord that he's never judged you, never condemns you, never criticizes you, never speaks to others about you behind your back. But everything he does in your life is positive. Everything he does by his spirit is to further his will in your life. Now thank him that as you live this word out, you're going to bear much fruit. That means the lives of other people, both within the body and outside the body, are going to be impacted because of the fruit that is being produced in your life by the Holy Spirit. So why don't you tell the Lord, Lord, I want you to be glorified in my life by bearing much fruit, much fruit, much fruit that lasts, the fruit of love, the fruit of love that you give to me for those around me, the fruit of love for those that you cause to cross my path, to, to actually, you know, that I meet day by day. Let there always be that action and reaction of love. Lord, I want to come to the place where even when people do things I find difficult, even when they criticize or judge or condemn me, that I always am like Jesus. I answer with love. I answer with mercy. I answer with forgiveness. I answer with prayer. I don't answer with anger or bitterness or offense. Lord, I want to be like that. I want to be like Jesus, where my response is always one of love. Come on, can you pray this? Tell the Lord. I mean, you know, don't just think, oh, yeah, that's a good idea. Really earnestly pray. It's the fervent prayers of the righteous that avail much. God wants to know you really, really, really desire to live like this. You just don't think it's a good idea because it's the word I preached this morning. But you really, really desire this. Lord, I really, really desire to be that person of love. I really desire to live in such a way for you that I'm laying down my life for others. That I'm laying down my life for my friends. That I'm living for others. I really, really, really want to live like this, Lord. I really, really, really want to please you. I really, really, really want to honor you. By fulfilling your word. I really want to become the person of love that you want me to be. I really want to be that person of joy that you've called me to be. I really want to be that son who serves. I really, really, really want to live as your friend so that I can know that you, you are my friend. Oh, thank you, thank you, thank you, Jesus. Thank you, you say, I am your friend if I do what you command you. Lord, I want to live as your friend because I'm doing what you command me. Thank you, thank you, thank you, love. Lord, thank you, Lord. Thank you that your love conquers all, that love overcomes, that love never fails. Lord, you say it in your word, love never fails. Praise your holy name. Bless your holy name. Thank you, Lord. I will not fail if I continue in love. I will never fail if I continue in love. I praise you and I bless you and I thank you. I thank you, Lord. I thank you for your mercy that restores me whenever I I mess up in any way. And Lord, even if others judge me, I thank you that you don't. I thank you, Lord, that you just restore me. You put me back together with you. And I praise you and I bless you. Come on, I want to be happy. Can we have some happy people here this morning? Hallelujah. Thank you, thank you, thank you, Jesus. Praise you, praise you, praise you. You know, back in the charismatic days, there was a chorus that everybody sung. This is my commandment, that you love one another. People sang it all the time, all the time, all the time. Might not be a bad thing to sing, eh? Or at least to be constantly speaking on our lips. This is my command. Love one another as I have loved you.
Just before we finish, it doesn't mean that you don't have love for people. It's all a matter of degree, isn't it? That we're to love as he has loved us. Praise God. So just turn to those around you and say, God has called me to love you. Thank you for listening to this Kingdom Faith podcast. We trust it's been an encouragement to you. For more information and resources by Kingdom Faith and for our other audio and video podcasts, please visit kingdomfaith.com.